Perspective Shift is brought to you by fdailycoaching.com. If you're seeking assistance to help navigate you through a difficult time or feel challenged to reach your full potential, Frank Daly can guide you to a perspective that will allow you to utilize your imagination and experience a more fulfilling and satisfying life. Frank has been working with people for over 20 years as a coach, helping them understand the power they have to transform their lives. Welcome to Perspective Shift. <laughs> Welcome. How we doing, Frank? Doing well, doing well, man. Good. Happy Memorial Day to you. Yeah. Bright and early. Yeah, it is early. So almost halfway through the year. Yep. Yeah, nice, man. So how, how was your week? Uh, it was great. Uh, got a busy week, but uh, things are moving well. I'm enjoying the fact that it's not too hot in here in Arizona yet. Yeah. We're getting a slow creep into summer, which is nice. Yeah, it was still cool. I still got the, I think we, I got the... Uh, I don't know if the doors are open now, but I had them open this morning. Yeah, nice. Which is rare for this time of year. Yeah, definitely. But, uh, I'll take every moment I can. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. for sure. <laughs> How about yourself? You have a good week? Yeah, a really good week. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Like Any, anything cool going on with clients or whatnot? Um, yeah, I'll say most stuff. Just, I, I, that's the cool thing about my life. It's like I'm either uh, coaching people or I'm in the salon doing stuff. But we're, yeah. we, we get into these pretty cool conversations that weren't... Uh, like obviously with my clients, uh, with, with the coaching stuff, um, it's it's already set that we're going to be talking about something in this field. Yeah. But with my other clients and my friends, um, we just fall into these conversations. I don't force them by any means because it's not something that um, is for everybody. I wouldn't want someone doing it to me, I'll tell you that. I you know, know what you mean. So, uh, yeah, but it always ends up in those conversations, you know. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, that's the most natural progression. Uh, you know, I think it's funny. Kayla and I always talk about this. Well, like these concepts and stuff, that there is nothing else to talk about, <laughs> you know, when it comes down to what's going on in life and everything, um, and how we're thinking, how we're feeling, our participation, et cetera, you know, um, is part of our everyday experience that we're calling life. So if we've got stuff that's showing up in our lives, you know, that we deem, you know, um, stressful or we deem, uh, you know, n- uh, non-enjoyable or non-preferential. These are all uh, uh, little signs. These are all little breadcrumbs like, hey, look, you know, relax or hey, look, pull back, you know, duh, you know, uh, go, the, go the other route. Yeah. What, what, do, you, what do you think a uh, big part of that plays in? Like, because I often when I sit there and contemplate and do self-inquiry, you wonder about these, what we call negative emotions. Are we trying to get rid of them? Are we trying to understand them? What is it that you think it is? Well, I don't think it's get rid of them because I do believe they're there for a reason. All right. As a pointer, you know. Um, But why do we need pointers? Well, because I I guess, number one, the the biggest, in my opinion, would be the fact that, um, I guess the way to say it is like, I, I, I want to talk about duality for a little bit. Like duality, the world we live in is a duality, you know, experience. So, so we have these ups, we've got these downs. Everything's got an ebb, everything's got a flow. Um, just like climbing up a hill, you know, it's it gets harder and harder and harder, and then you get to the top, and then things start to get easier as you come down the other side. I think that's part of this experience that we call life. Yeah, well, and that's just it. That's just one aspect of it because even when we look at the world what we call duality and then we try to say that we're all one well those those two um theories don't fit together yeah because you know but this i look at there's different ways of looking at it. so you have a quarter it's one item mm-hmm. but it's got a heads and a tail so is, is the hail, heads and the tail the duality of the quarter i guess you could look at it that way it's different perspective but it's really just one quarter and then everything that we are really experiencing we're actually experiencing through, through sensation what we call the five senses mm-hmm um, so now even in science, you know, you see a lot of scientists starting to talk about this. Is there really a world out there? Well, it is, you know, and again, um, I'm not here to debate whether there is or not, but when I sit from my own experience, I just sit there and I'm like, okay, what is in my experience? So right now it's you and I sitting in front of two microphones. We got a laptop, we got uh, a system here, you know, making the sound well, and we got video camera hitting us. Mm-hmm. Um, but nothing else exists other than in my imaginative thought that some, something else is going on besides what you and I are doing. 
but I myself personally aren't witnessing. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I'm like, so when we start to look at life from that vantage point, like, what is it? Well, it's just interactions and acquisitions with different people and, and conversation. And everyone seems to be trying to get to this place of feeling good and not feeling bad. And I'm like, okay, but what does that mean? Because there's some people feeling good. It might be somebody else is feeling bad. Well, I think you also just kind of nailed it when you said we're all trying to get someplace. Yeah. That's that's yeah. what we're all trying to do is everybody's trying to get somewhere. And the, I, in my opinion, the point is to realize that there's nowhere to get to. Well, you can look at science and, you know, outside the opinion, there is nowhere to get to. There isn't. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. this weird, very weird idea that we've created, especially in Western, you know, culture, that there's always somewhere to be. There's always something to achieve. There's always something to become. Yeah. There, You know, uh, there's always more money to be made. There's always something better out there that you can buy. It's a constant, never-ending unsatisfactory in this moment must be chasing a new moment experience yeah and it, it and because it's fleeting so i think i think based on this type of um maybe the way it's setting so if you look at the the philosophies from the east and then from the west they're so they're so entwined because even in the east if they didn't have the west their theories or understanding wouldn't they wouldn't know if it were to work to be working as well you know so sometimes, you know, if you, you put a warm jacket on you to really test it, you have to go out in the cold, Yeah, <laughs> you know, to know if it's, if it's working. So I think it's the emergence of the East and the West. One isn't better than the other, but it's the emergence of it. Yeah. And then when you co- come into one singularity, actually it created that. So we create the duality of the East and the West. Well, but an illusion, there really isn't. And I also think like if, if there was one perfect, like if we were all supposed to be uh, uh, you know, uh, doing those things taught in the East, the East would be in this blissful, perfect, you know, untouchable, you know, uh, spot in life, but they're not, you know, there's still uh, poverty, there's still sickness, there's still death, you know, all that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, but also too, it's like, it's all, everything becomes, rel- um, like Einstein came up with, everything becomes, uh, relative to the state which you're in. So depending on how I'm explaining something, it's all relative to the person I'm talking to. Yeah. Even relative to the day I'm in to how I perceive it. So mm-hmm. everything's always changing in that way. But um yeah, it is very um you know, it, it's very interesting. But what I notice is as I go in and and let go of these um beliefs uh ones and get more into concepts of knowing because, uh, yeah, we, we need concepts in order to communicate, right? Without it, I realize, okay, if we just say, what's the concept of a car? What's the concept of life? Mm-hmm. You know, anything. All of a sudden, if I try to get rid of those concepts and just say it is, all of a sudden we're, we're kind of lost, yeah. you know, from, from the way we communicate now. Um, you know, but as we, as we get better at communicating, spend more time with each other, less words are spoken, and you see the essence of it. And the more time you spend with yourself, the same thing. What I've noticed is my thoughts slow down. Or I don't grab thoughts. So they're not mine. I let them drift by. The more time I spend with myself, the less I allow a thought to pull me. But they're still there, just like clouds. But but that's another you know aspect to this whole thing is we haven't been taught what thoughts are. Or in my opinion, correctly, at least. I mean, we're taught that, you know, when an idea or some thought pops into our head, we take ownership of it. It's ours. Yeah. Um, but I, I I look at life as like, like was someone supposed to teach us this? <laughs> or was this to learn it? I don't think any... Is who Who's going to teach you that? Yeah. You know, cause I, I, if I, I go to... I mean... Our- <laughs> yeah, when I, when I was younger, I went to church, and if I really listened to what the priest said, he was right. But I didn't do it. And, you know... Did he do a poor job explaining it, or did I do a poor job listening? I don't know. Is it the chicken or the egg? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like I was, you know, <laughs> I was talking to, talking to a client about like uh, she was talking about like how she had to have the sex talk with a child, her yeah. son. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I was joking around to some degree, but I'm like, you know, I'm like, did you have a talk with him when he was getting ready to walk? Like, what do you mean? Did he just get up and walk? And she, she's like, yeah, I'm like, he'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll now, figure I out. understand the whole protection and, and the repercussions for it and stuff like that. So, 
um, you know, obviously when a child starts walking, the sole of the ground, they're falling, isn't going to be a big deal. Probably want to keep them away from the stairwell, but or the street. But um, but it is funny because if like if you don't never have these conversations, I believe human beings will eventually come to them. Now there is there is it's kind of like a game. That's why I think we're we're in this like um, on a, in a play, and the director, if you will, or somebody keeps trying to push our attention elsewhere, but yet we're trying to maintain who, what's right in front of us. And we do that. We have this amazing time. When you get distracted, we have to start over again. But that's the brilliance of it. That's why we like to watch sports um, and people just being in the midst, like even watching someone painting. Um, they have to stay completely focused in order to go with the flow of it. So with sports especially, because they're the other team, if you're playing in a sport, the, the, the opposing team is trying to get you out of your lane if you will out of, you know out of that state mm -hmm. and we like to watch that we like to watch that unfold you know so and we're seeing it in um you know unless the game is fixed we're seeing it pretty natural pretty raw and this is why people are like why do we pay athletes so much money because most people are unwilling to do what the athletes do so the next best thing is to watch them yeah like if everyone got out and confronted their life and <clears throat> And the, and the unknown, because that's what an athlete does when they step on the field or a court, whatever it, you know, game they're playing. But they're stepping into the unknown. Now, they've practiced. They're psychologically prepared. But they have no idea what's going to happen from the beginning to the end. Um, but most, it seems like, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like most people don't want to, are willing to do that. So they'll do the next best thing and watch it. Yeah. And so you ask me why. You know why aren't they get why are they getting paid so much money? I believe that's the reason. Their attention is going to it because for that moment, when you're watching it, like they neurologists say this, like if I'm watching someone play the guitar, say like I was at a concert watching Eddie Van Halen play the guitar, and I get so immersed in it, the the brain connections, the synapses in his brain and mine would almost match. Now again, he's playing the guitar, I'm watching it, but for a moment, you think you can do that. Right, so obviously where it changes, he he can maintain that and start that. For me, it was just a connection through that. So he pulled me into that field by him starting playing the guitar. So at that moment, like wow, okay, well that's what happens when the athlete, when you watch an athlete, you know, do something amazing on the field or the court or whatever it is. All of a sudden, for a moment, you get tied into that, so you're pulled into that. But then you think, well, I'm not the athlete. I can't play the guitar like Eddie Van Halen. I, I can't do all this other stuff. And then you start to doubt yourself and you get into this place. So you keep then wanting the drug called the outside world. And that seems to be the cycle that we're coming out of because more people are talking about that. How do we relinquish all this stuff? And the one thing I come to notice is you don't stop doing that. You just become aware of that's what's happening. So if I'm at a concert watching, obviously Eddie Van Halen's no longer with us, but somebody else, and I'm like getting into that zone, I could be in the zone and be aware of the zone at the same time. I can be aware that I'm watching a game. I could be aware I'm watching TV. And when I do that, it doesn't have what we deem to be the negative effect onto the psyche of the human mind. It's just part of the action. But if you're not aware, it's going to draw you in, and you, yeah, you'll you'll feel it. Well, that's what happens as we get <clears throat> we get real sucked in to these moments, and and if life feels so real, and or it feels very you know overwhelming, you know, or it feels very stressful, you know, there's all these uh, you know different aspects, and, and it's up to us to pull back and realize, okay, we can maintain this level of awareness, which is I'm aware of what's happening. But I don't have to, you know, I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. You know, I I am fully aware of what's happening, what's going on, but where I put my attention grows. And in that case, you know, I need to put my attention where I ultimately want to be. Kind of like that that one saying, you know, it's, it's not f about focusing on the um, obstacles, it's focusing on the goal. You want to put your attention on the goal, not the obstacles, that's how you're going to get there. Uh, like uh, skiing down the mountain. If you're, you know, focused on the path, you're going to stay on the path. If you're focused on hitting a tree, you're going to eat shit and eat, you know, yeah. hit a tree. <clears throat> yeah. 
Now, like, what do you do personally to, like, maintain this understanding? Well, I mean... Because, it, it, you know, from what I understand, is like, the reason we're talking about this, it doesn't seem that anyone has these natural abilities, or do they? Well, everyone has this natural ability. Well, I'm, It just kind of gets covered up through conditioning and, you know, yeah, our well, social Yeah, but I mean, naturally come out. Like, it seems people naturally just go for, for uh, the outside world rather than go within. So, it... it well, it overtakes their nature. I think that's because we have the blind leading the blind. And what I mean by that is, you know, we were taught that the old, there only is the outside world. But, what, but why, why do you think that is, though? You know, well, I, I think it was the blind leading the blind. I think we no, I'm saying people like, don't know that. Yeah, because like, like when we examine this life and the story, we go back, it's, uh, it seems like it was always life blind leading the blind. Mm -hmm. So, but why, why do you think that is? Uh, part of the experience that this uh, realm is what you know earth i've heard earth likened and akin to that of like a school and i think that's a great analogy of yeah. what this experience is which is we as souls come here to remember who and what we are rather than um come here um or i shouldn't say rather i should say um, that that is the experience of life, which is, you know, we incarnate, uh, we are souls, we are ha souls that are having a human experience, and we are um, waking up and remembering our true nature, self-realization. <laughs> That's what I think the, the purpose of this experience on Earth is. is. Um, that's the only... In my mind, that's the only thing that can make sense about this experience because we're, we're spinning on this rock in a, this galaxy with hundreds and trillions of other galaxies out there and around us, etc. To think that we just came here simply to to, to work jobs, pay money, you know, yeah. it's, it's just it's not. But, like, um, how do we know we're awake? Well, I, I guess... When you like, say, how, like, in other words, I don't think if you ask anybody, most people would think they're awake, mm -hmm. or you know, and every at to some level, everyone is conscious if they have an experience, even if they're doing something that isn't working for them in the moment, they're still conscious of it. They mm -hmm. may not know how to get out of it, but like when we start to talk about these these things, I hear spiritual pe teachers talk about it, um, and not all of them, but a lot of them come from this place as well. I know better, and I'm like, well. <laughs> You know, do you? Do we? Yeah. Um, I don't know. And um, I think when you know, when I when I actually look listen to somebody, they encourage me to to look look at something differently. Well, all of a sudden, it wasn't the way they're looking at it. It's the fact that I have a different way of looking at it, and the fact that I have different ways of looking at it. What is the right way? And I'm realizing there is no right or wrong way. And that's really my conclusion up till now. So, is the idiot? better than the spiritual teacher or is the spiritual teacher better than the idiot? I'm like, well, if there wasn't an idiot, would there be a teacher? You know? Or or the idiot and the teacher won. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Actually, in the book, The Idiot, you find out <laughs> we're all idiots. Yeah. yeah. Or we have potential that's, you know, the idiot, what, what people deem to be the idiot was the intelligent one. Exactly. And maybe it's just because the idiot stood out and everyone was in line. Maybe that's, prob maybe that's probably the game. When too many people get on that side of the ship, it's time to move to the other side of the ship. So we, we create a new system, a new way of looking at it. Well, that's what we do. Yeah. And you just know that is we're always trying to, oh, nope, this is the way we got to do this. Way. Yeah. And yeah. we've been doing that now for, you know, three, four, five hundred years Millennia. that we have on record. Oh, totally. Oh, we've been doing I it since mean, humans are born. I'm talking yeah. the, the Western culture that we're experiencing today that's like, what, you know, 300, 400, a couple hundred years old. Oh, the Western culture? Yeah. Oh, no, way older than that. Roman well, Empire was Western. I guess I just mean, um, like, n with what we're calling science nowadays, et cetera, you know, oh, yeah. all that type yeah, of stuff. Yeah, like, so if you go back to, like, what we call, like, sophisticated science, like New Newtonian science from that period, like, about 400 years. So, or, um, yeah, maybe. But, but but you know what I mean? Yeah, but, it, yeah, and it do, it's, it's interesting because I often wonder that. I'm like, okay, well, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm in a play, and... Um, I'm learning and responding to the actors on the stage, so to speak. And I, I just, you know, I don't purposely try to do it, but I'm like, I always like to throw something in there, you know, um, just, you know, say something, see somebody's response. 
you know? Kind of like how um, uh, Father Sean was talking about, like when you're in a play, you want to throw somebody, uh, give somebody a line that's going to compliment for them to come back and then reverse and inadvertently or the same, you, you, you give it back mm -hmm. to keep this going on. Um, where when I do see people get into these uh, tense situations and they argue, it, that doesn't last. It's a short-lived um, understanding. But there is something interesting about it too, I find intriguing about that, when people argue points for someone to be right and wrong. And what I realize, what, it's intriguing is watching people get upset <laughs> to me, I don't know why. Well, Maybe there's something wrong with me for doing that. That's kind of um, ingrained in our society, you know? Just the way we experience stuff. Like we, we grow up right now and we're in this culture of um, this is wrong, this is right. Uh, here's the facts, here's the source. But we don't talk about how all of that is made up. Yeah, but, but I'm saying we've always, there's no time in history when we were never like that. Yeah. Like even spiritual people would argue. <laughs> like what's the best way to do that? And, oh, no, you're, no, you're wrong. <laughs> you, you must meditate first in the morning and then move on. <laughs> it's like, oh, shit, I'm doing it wrong today, you know. But, um, and, and again, I'm not here to say I know. Um, I just notice the experience and everything I'm experiencing in the outside world is constantly shifting and changing. So I see the replication of this uh, fractal understanding that, okay, this is just a play. And I recognize if I, if I get into the play and hold my ground and, and I compliment somebody else, it will, the game will continue. But if I don't, if I lose myself and start to break it down, well, the game's over. Do we want the game to be over? I'm like, well, some days we do. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> some days we definitely do. Yeah, some days it feels like you're playing um, tic-tac-toe, and some days it feels like you're playing chess. Mm -hmm. But I guess that's, you know, what would chess be without tic-tac-toe? I guess what I'm starting to learn is to appreciate those hard days, um, you know, and appreciate the the the, the non-up moments, the down moments, and... and, and understand and know that you can find love even in those shitty situations that has been a big growth thing for me these last six months and just this year in general is um it you have to learn to love like truly love and appreciate you know the downs and love again is a misunderstood uh, concept like I, love is not like oh I, I like this experience this is great blah blah this is the best i, I can't live without it you know type of thing Love is more like a compassionate knowing, and it's a uh, state of everything will work out. Um, everything is good. You know, it's more uh, coming from a place of knowing rather than a place of lack and despair and struggle. Um, yeah, that, that's yeah, something what, big. What do you think about the idea that there's actually no such thing as the opposite of love? When somebody says there's no such thing as the opposite of love? Yeah. Well, uh, I get that because, I mean, there there only is love. And then it's our perceptions of a situation that we skew it and we say, you know, this can't be love because I'm in pain or because I'm suffering or because I'm yeah. sad. And so we say because there's suffering or because there's pain, love cannot exist there. And I feel like that's incorrect. Well, yeah, but it, it kind of like love. Let's take light because it'll be easy to explain because... Mm -hmm. Love is very arbitrary to most people, and you know, like, what is love? Well, people know what it feels like, but so now that scientists know that there's nowhere in the universe that there isn't light, and, and what they don't understand, they just call dark matter. So there's energy there, mm -hmm. but the energy is at the level from the human existence that, um, like, in other words, if I turn all the lights off in this room and it's nighttime, there's still light bleeding in from outside, but I wouldn't be able to read a book. Mm -hmm. All right. So throughout the day, I need different degrees of light in order to achieve or to accomplish whatever task I'm doing. And when I'm going to bed at night, I want it as dark as possible, but there's still light there at some level of measurable energy. So love is the same as light. It's just that what, what I believe and what I've come to understand is when you put a lot of filters over it, you diminish the degree of love that's coming in to where it seems like there is no love. Just like at nighttime, oh, there's no light. I'm like, well, measure um, by the way my eyes pull in light and the way my visual cortex sees it. Yes, there isn't. But 
empirically there is light. It's just not enough for me to read a book or um, do something that requires uh, the human uh, being to see a page on the, in a book. Mm-hmm. So love is the same way. So they tell you, look, at there's no opposite of light. It's just the different degrees of light um, contrast coming in and out. So light is the only thing, you know, if it wasn't for light, you couldn't make darkness. And if darkness was an actual thing, like I remember somebody saying this, but like if you went into a room and it was fully lit and you had a box and, you know, the box had a lid on it and there was no light in there so that the box is completely dark. If I lift that lid off, there's a, there's a light, there's a room dim from the darkness in the box. <laughs> no. But if I went into a dark room and I had a box with a lid on it, but inside the box was a little candle, mm-hmm. and if I lifted the lid up, the room would illuminate based on the amount of light that's coming off that candle. So the only essence that we have is light. Yeah. The only essence that we have is love. And... And that's that's my evaluation based off self inquiry. You know, if somebody else out there can bring it up and I could sit with them, talk to them, I'm like, okay, but so far there is only light, there is only love, just different degrees of it, but there isn't opposite. Just like again, I use this analogy all the time, but uh, minus ten isn't the opposite of eighty degrees. Mm-hmm. It's just different temperature of degree. That's it. And but you know, it's difficult for a human being to survive. In the minus 10 opposed to the 80 degrees is just, it's, you know, it's comfortable. It's very soothing to the human existence. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, uh, the, how we experience that love too is how much we light up that room. I I like the analogy you're using with the candle where you open the box, you know, um, even, you know, in this immense amount of darkness, that little light can fill the whole room. And when we allow just a little bit of love to come in, that can that can change the whole dynamic of how what, how stressful or how much you're suffering or how much pain is given in a situation, and I don't know. Um, growing up in the Western culture, we there's like this idea that any time that we're not feeling good, um, it's a bad thing, and there's a, you know a remedy for it, there's a pill for it, there's a, you know a another a new job that will not make you feel inadequate you know there's x amount of money to be made to do this we're we're constantly being sold on a bill of goods you know in this experience that anything that is not the way we picture it ought not to happen and shouldn't be something that's uh you know it, it shouldn't be something if it's not according to our plan and that that's a um that's an issue. That's something we have to overcome. So we're constantly trying to overcome this or, you know, figure this out. We don't do a lot of being in a uh, Western world. There's not a lot of just allowing things to flow, allowing things to attract and come to you. We're taught that you have to go out and get it. You got to struggle. You got to strive. And that's, it's a backwards way to be taught, you know, um, I feel like the more we begin to let go, the more we'll begin to let things flow, it, the better things will work out and begin to go in the direction that we, you know, perceive as preferential. Yeah. But even if you look at the Eastern philosophies, that's how they all started, right? What, where was Buddha living? Mm-hmm. In a palace. Yep. So he started out with all the things that we talk about in the West here. He was a very rich person growing up. His dad, you know, ran the palace as a king, however you want to look at it. Mm-hmm. And then it was, you know, early age, the story goes, that he had seen, he was, I guess he was um, guarded from seeing any um, poverty poverty or... and death and stuff like that. So, but one time he had a glimpse of it and he realized, what the hell? And, and obviously it was an older age, so he didn't, <laughs> it was pretty much sudden, which is, would freak. Well, he didn't even know that existed. No. So he, he was already at an age where he was being educated and stuff like that, so... Mm-hmm. When he came across it, it really disturbed him. And so later on in life, he left the palace and went off into the wilderness and disowned everything and realized, well, this is not it either. Yep. Which and, is the most important thing, which is realizing, yeah, hey, I don't need to go to the other end of the spectrum. So I think like what we call here in the West, so maybe, you know, it's not just here in the United States, but other countries, like we came 
going off your premise. If we came here with the soul contract, we purposely came into this world to wash, to take that suit off. Or I shouldn't say take the suit off, to reverse the suit. Because we also didn't come here just to, you know, go into a cave either. That could be just as um, Western of an idea than anything else. Yeah. You know, because I'm going to find it in there. I'm like, what is that you're looking for? There's nothing to search for. See, that's the constant paradox. We're we're searching for something that is not out there. Yeah, but... Um, it, it's St. Francis of Assisi said it best, which is the place you're searching from is the place you're searching for. Yeah. You know, and I thought that that's a really, really powerful statement. And it's, you know... Um, it's not about going outside of us. It's not about achieving something. It's not about searching and discovering something. And I feel like on this spiritual path that all of us are on, we and we were talking about this off air, but you get into this like um, uh, cadence, just like you would in anything, which is you know uh, researching these different types of spiritual topics, concepts, etc. Different teachers hearing this in different ways, etc. As if there is some another uh, speaker or teacher or something you need to hear that you don't already know. And it's when we get really quiet and, and when we go into meditation, uh, there's, there's nothing that we need to figure out. Everything becomes available to us. And so I think um, it's important that we, we don't fall in the same type of traps just with um, things that we would deem spiritual. Yeah, like a lot of the new age, um, and I hate to throw it like on the bus, but a lot of new age um, was like that. Yeah, you know, they would they would say you must do it this way, not that way, and all of a sudden they just they create another form outside. Well, and I hear that all the time with the people talking about like affirmations and stuff like that, and manifestation and creation. Of course, that's all existing, but we don't we're not talking about it as if we're always creating and always manifesting and. Everything we're doing in this moment is a creation. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, we're, we're told like, oh, you got to utter these words X amount of times each day. Yeah. And then now we're creating a routine. Now we've got something rigid. Now we're just falling back into this human trap, which is, no, it has to be done this way in order to accomplish it. Yeah. There is no right way to accomplish anything. No, and even if you find a modality and it starts to work for you, you naturally want to shift into a new one. That's aligned with what you're doing, right? You know, um, and everyone gauges what is good and what's bad, or what we deem to be good and bad. And what I say good and bad is, is you have patterns, and one one may be a cancellation pattern, and the other one is is a pattern that's uh, that's cultivated by um, you stepping into it. And it grows from that, so it's you know it's not breaking apart; it's actually expanding. So when we jump into that. It doesn't matter what kind of modality you use to get in there. Um, it's all good. It's just that when we step into or fight against what's in front of us, we get into a cancellation pattern. And everyone recognizes that's wrong. That's we they don't like it, but we tend to blame the outside world. Why would we got into this argument if it wasn't that person who said that thing? Mm-hmm. You know, and okay, but you don't control of that person, so you can either be a bitter human being and go live in a cave, or you could try to figure out how. To let go of that, and these seems to be, there seems to be these processes. That's why even I counsel myself this way, and I counsel other people, because from the day you were born, depending where you live, but if you lived here in the United States, you were you were taught a certain way of looking at life. All right, and not all of it was wrong, by the way. You know, just it's just a different way. Yeah, but then all of a sudden you realize it's not working. It's like why? Well. The premise was you're trying to maintain this thing. You know, it's like if you're watching a movie, how the movie starts and how it develops and how it ends is what makes it a movie. But everyone wants to just that peak point to constantly happen. So they're constantly looking for that. I'm like, no, that doesn't make a movie. That makes a scene. That's all it does. But if your life is a, you know, if you live to about 100 years old, if your life is a 100-year-old movie, all these um, things are going to come in, and you have no control of them. If you did, you wouldn't choose anything other than what you knew, and that creates uh, stagnation, in which you really can't, in a 
in the real world, you can't do that. Nothing is stagnant. Everything's moving. But it, you can, relative to where you were, okay, I don't want to do something different. I'm going to stay here. Well, that then starts to haunt you. That starts to get to you. And people know that. It's like, what is it? And I'm like, well, the internal guidance system we have never turned off. But we seldom use it. We seldom listen to it. We, sell, we often listen to um, logic. Now, when logic and your higher intuition connect, it's brilliant. That's how we start to create. So we're not doing away with logic. We don't do away with the left side of the brain because the right side of the brain might come up with the idea, but without the left side, you have nothing to imprint into the physical world. You know, like an artist, like, oh, this is great, this painting. Well, let me see what it looks like. I don't have a brush. <laughs> I can't do it. So you can't really share it with the world. And that's why we came here, to share things with the world and we're we're starting to, it's funny we're starting to come to this place where like there is writing there's a right and a wrong way of doing things for each individual there's a right and uh, right and a wrong way to do things for a culture a country and so on and so forth but people we almost feel like okay my way is going is disappearing I'm like no your way doesn't have to disappear it just there might be less people than before they would agree with you, but just because they don't agree with you doesn't mean you have to get them to agree with you and, and get get bitter over it, right? Because mm -hmm. that's the world we live in. You know, there's different scenes in different movies and there's different actors and there might be just an actor that comes in and does one little scene, does an amazing job, but you don't see them for the rest of the movie, <laughs> you know? So we live in this hodgepodge and where people are, I really feel creating anxiety and depression is they continuously analyze their life with no <laughs> with no real objective to what they're analyzing <laughs> like they don't know and until you do like sit down and ask yourself what is it that I'm doing and don't listen to somebody else just close your eyes what am I experiencing has, has we, it, we don't get breathing room to do stuff like that that's something that we have to come to on our own and I think that's that's well, the, why you always have to. There you is know? no one can hold your hand. That's it. So I think that's the issue with the, 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 you know, any any great teacher will say, "Well, I'll I don't teach. I might point, and give you another thing to observe, but the thing I'm giving you to observe is just different than the thing you're observing. So that opens up your mind, but it doesn't mean how I told you to observe it is better. It's different. But if you only observed a situation one way, that's the detrimental thing to the human being. But I think that's what's going on is everybody's looking for somebody to teach them how to observe and, and tell them how to perceive something because we've been taught that the outside world is a rigid matter that is absolute and unchangeable, and that's not the case. So how did you how did you personally come to a place where you find that that wasn't the case? Well, I mean, honestly, it was through a, a lot of different uh, trial and error research, et cetera. I mean, even Einstein, you know, you can find, you can, you know, read his quotes and his work. But he, he says, you know, there is no such thing as physical matter. And that's a direct end stop quote. Okay. And so why do we believe Einstein? Well, I mean, see, uh, that goes back to like a level of conditioning, which is, hey, okay, this gentleman's brought, you know, some different mathematical and, you know, yeah. equations that have, you know, uh, uh, benefited, you know, the scientific community. And even that is a level of conditioning. Like, why listen to, to I mean, probably uh, the relativity, you know, was the, the best thing, in my opinion, that Einstein shared with us because it gave us a way to look at the world like everything is relative. So from that standpoint, like um, I respect his work, if you yeah. will. Um, but there is no, it, it, it really is just conditioning. Yeah. There, there is no reason why I should, you know, believe Einstein. Well, and, and I didn't say that to say Einstein was wrong. It's Of course not. There's a way to actually become the scientist yourself and t take his work. It's like, okay, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but examine what he talked about. And when you do it and you place it into your your experience, your existence, you realize, oh my God, when I'm asleep, in a deep sleep, I'm in a completely different experience. And then when I'm dreaming in a dream state, 
I'm in a different experience. And then when I'm in a waking state, I'm in a different experience. But the essence of who I was examining that never changed. There's a part of me that was in all three experiences that never changed. And that's the real us, not this physical reality. Yeah, so when, real. when you go back to that place like a scientist would, all of a sudden you start to understand what Einstein was talking about rather than just taking his word for it. You know, most people take his word for it. Like, don't ever take anyone's word for anything. And Einstein wouldn't you want to take the word for it anyway. He would want you to examine it as best you can. That's true. We're all scientists. We all do deductive reasoning and take, you know, okay, I got a little experiment going on. I'm like, I'm going to eat this type of food. Okay. You know, the theory stands out. So um, someone told me about it and it seems to work for them. Okay, I'm going to do the experiment on myself. So I started eating the food and, you know, you know, okay, I haven't felt anything. Like, how long have you been doing? A week. Well, you got to give it, got to get it a month, you know? So you go, you go and do, you do this thing for a month, you eat a certain way, you start working out. All of a sudden, you start to see the shift and changes. Like, wow, this is wild. Okay. Then, what is it about the way I ate? What is it about what I was doing that made it change? And then you go deeper into it. Is it because I like this or I very, it started working? Um, it worked in the beginning, but not in the end, or it was working closer to the end, not in the beginning. Well, what was going on in those times? Did you finally just accept it? Were you finally let go? Or in the beginning, you enjoyed it, and by the end, it became boring and it wasn't working as well? What state were you in when you were part of that examination? Yeah. And that's what we're finding out, too, is anyone that does some type of scientific um, analysis, um, say you're doing a study with a group of people, um, the person heading up the study has influence on the people they, for one, you know, when you're choosing people, you might be limited to who you can choose, but you're going to start to choose people that are right in front of you or, oh, I like that person. So say there's like 200 people, I can only pick 100 people. You're going to, you're going to pick them based on how you feel, mm-hmm. you know? You might say, oh, like that person looks like they're going to fight me on it. Well, if I want that, I'm going to choose that person. Just kind of have like, a lawyer picks a jury for a trial yep. based on that. So you, it, that's already in us. So when we do these studies, somebody else can do the same study with a different group of people with a different onset of thought. And if they stay close to neutral as possibly can, it can't be completely neutral or they wouldn't want to even do the test. They might find these correlations and connections. Actually, they will. Um, find them. That's why we keep studying these things. It never ends. So there is there is something there, but what is it about that that works? And right now, science has correlations, but they don't really have the causation. Or one could say the causation is awareness or consciousness, which, <laughs> how do you define that? How do you define consciousness? I, 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 if, if, I, if somebody really asked me that, I would say awareness. You know, if somebody's like, you know, how can you explain to me what consciousness is? I would say it's a, about your perception and level of awareness. So that, so, and then every human being on the planet is conscious. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, yeah. We, we are, but it's an uncovering of that. There's different levels of the, the, this consciousness, this awareness, but everyone is aware that they exist. Yeah. And that's a gift. And it's then from there, there's different levels. And then that's how you begin to experience. Is there different, different levels, or is just this way? And well, that? I do in the I do believe there's levels in the sense of like this third reality experience is very dense. And I remember like as I began to learn these different concepts, you know, and um, really dive deep into this on a personal level, like I began to experience life different. Not like it physically, like the colors or the, uh, you know, the 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 physical matter, what we call physical matter, like that doesn't change, but how you experience it changes. And so like, it's not as like, you don't need to do as much matter on matter. Like you, you realize that things can fall into place and that they don't need to, A plus B does not, you know, you don't have to, um, do something the Newtonian way is probably the best way to say it. Yeah. And it can still work out. So, but I'm saying like, like, um, when have you experienced not physical? Non-physical? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I've had meditations that have been great where I've had non-physical experiences. Like I've had some meditations when, you know, I'll open my eyes after a meditation. And it, the the feeling is like, 
it's different than anything I've experienced, you know. But like, how do we know it's not physical? If we, um, I guess because it, it's there's a sensation there, but it's not through taste, touch, smell, you know, or our five normal senses. But there's some sort of like um, experience there. Yeah, but I'm saying, it's when you close your eyes, the only thing you're lo- missing out on is um, is sight. Mm-hmm. When you you still have the other four senses when you're meditating, you can yeah. still taste your saliva. You could still um, if you're picturing a, a beach, I could still I could smell the air, mm-hmm. um, and even when my eyes are closed, I could still feel the uh, what we call energy, the vibrating essence of the boundary of what I think is my body. Yeah, you know. Um, but like when I notice it, not so much when I meditate. Um, it might happen when I meditate, but when I'm sleeping, when I have a dream, all of a sudden in that dream I could be, you know. Obviously, no, from the awareness, I'm sleeping in a bed in Chandler, Arizona. But in the dream, I could easily slip back into my high school 40 years ago mm-hmm. and be walking around it. And, you know, living in Arizona, my high school is in Long Island. That's roughly just under 3,000 miles. So in that, in that time period, I, I went all the way 3,000 miles, was in my high school. And then next thing I know, I was in, like, uh, in, in France. <laughs> and I was doing something weird there. And so there was no time and space in the physical way in which we look at here. So that was one other state, not necessarily a variance or a degree. It just was a different place. And then deep sleep, you know, the only thing is I, I know I was aware of it, but I don't have a, a memory of a thought of it. So I start to look at this, this three levels to this thing in the way we look at it, you know. And then, but in in the physical world, because we lo- love to be such high intellects, we create these multitudes of levels of how to explain that. Like, oh, I understand it better than you. I'm like, you understand it different. I don't. It's very difficult to see if someone understands it um, better. Maybe they have a deeper understanding of based on where they're at. And but we can explain it. It's because we're trying to describe the undescribable. You can't, yeah. So words are brilliant because words are fun. Words will get you to a place just like a cab will get you to the restaurant in which you want to go eat. But at some point you have to get out of the cab unless you're at a drive through <laughs> 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 I guess you get right in the cab there and then eat in the back seat. But uh, you know the point I'm trying to make. But that's part of the fun, you know, of yeah. this experience and of the duality. I mean, so this experience is a paradox. This experience is both. This experience is this and that, you know, it's, yeah. it is black and white. Um, like <laughs> that, that, that's what's so funny is we're constantly trying to describe something, pin something down that is both. Yeah. And, um, and I think in the act of describing it, but we're taught that things can't be both. We're taught that, you know, there's only one right way thing and this is why a lot of people struggle with well at some level we were but like even like we were also taught you know you know we were talking about the three stages of water you know whether it's ice a gas or a liquid it's still water Mm -hmm. so we look at these different things we were taught this maybe we someone might have not cross-referenced it they they probably do that like the way people are doing now um so you, you look at that, right? There's three states of water. Well, there's three states of my being. One is deep sleep, one is a dream state, and one is the awaking state. Mm-hmm. But in all three of those states, it's still water, or it's still me, mm-hmm. <laughs> essence. So um, it's just, uh, obviously, the, the steam is at a higher vibration, the, the water is at a low vibration, and obviously ice is the most uh, densest part of but it's moving slowly. Here, we, here we are in Western culture, and we're taught that only the waking state, the the waking state, is considered reality, and that the other states are just, uh, oh, that's cool, you know, oh, that's different. We're yeah. we're we're taught to discount that whole aspect of our life here in well, the Western yeah. culture. Well, yeah. Well, like we don't sit here and talk about you know oh our dream state. We don't talk. Well, and we, we are. No, of course, of course. <laughs> I'm insane. just saying that that right there is why a lot of people don't acknowledge this whole other half of us. You know, there's this whole other side of us yeah. that exists beyond this physical realm, and we're not taught that. We're not told about it. 
in fact we're <laughs> we, we pretend it doesn't exist and oh yeah that's weird sometimes you dream yeah yeah but you know yeah most people i know will dream and they'll talk about it and maybe it is maybe it's the group of people i hang out with so it's more open but you know they were still raised in the west as well mm-hmm. you know ramdas was raised in the west yeah uh, muji was raised in the west he was you know um and it's just a different way of looking at it and, you know um different you know so it's it's just a mixture of concepts and ideas and people are trying to find the right one that's why i'm not too quick to say this one's wrong because i think it's what happens like i notice for me that it's not that you're doing something wrong other than you thinking you're doing something wrong that makes you feel bad and when you feel bad you tend to go down that road of um you know separation Struggle. yeah you start to separate yourself because if, if i'm doing something wrong i don't want to be around anybody to prove i'm doing something wrong yeah so it takes a lot of uh you know takes guts to get out in front of people and talk about it and you're assuming they're right and i'm like no like this is conversation me and mike have like this is open we don't like i have no idea i'm still trying to say i'm never going to stop self-inquiry i'm like oh i finally made it you know <laughs> <laughs> i just it's like a I scientist yeah like the scientists of like the late 1800s thought like, okay, we're done. Newtonian physics, not much has changed over the last 200 years. <laughs> so we're done. And then all of a sudden quantum physics, like, hold on a second. Like, shit. Mm-hmm. So then things changed. And, and then there was people like the Einsteins and other people who were trying to connect Newtonian because it works, right? We see how it works, mm-hmm. how we can get a rocket into space. And then how do we connect it with the quantum? Like what's really going on to a deeper level? And I think we're still we're still developing that. Um, like I get the concept a little bit some days and some days I lose it. But um but I know I know empirically I'm just witnessing my character playing and you know, I try to keep my character in line. Sometimes it gets squirrely, you know. <laughs> but even then it's like okay. I'll say something. Say I say something to Karen, and she gets like, "What the hell did you have for?" And there was something in me that knew that she was going to get upset. And I'm like, "Oh, so why did I do that?" Yeah, you know, maybe it's part of our is the poke and prog, um, you know, kind of like a Zen master does to his pupil, prods them to see how they react, <laughs> you know. And I I believe we did it as kids with our friends to see if shit went down, where will they stand? So let me test them. <laughs> right now so when stuff goes down i know not to rely on this person i know to rely on that person perhaps that's part of the organism to stay alive in what we consider this three-dimensional world um you know so maybe it's maybe it's a good thing to do that you know <laughs> you just gotta pick the right day to do it or else Seriously. you know so why can't you be kind i'm like this is kind i'm just getting you ready for the world <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> um, and then also too, that's the other thing I want to touch on today. The one thing, and again, maybe it's because of me, and I was lucky my whole life. But the one thing that always pulled me out of everything was humor. Yeah. And I haven't met anyone that doesn't agree with that. Um, like I take some of these people. I'm not going to name names all of a sudden, but there were certain comedians that did more for racism than other people that stood up in podiums and talked about it in my opinion, again, this is my opinion, because they took a race, a racial um, apathet in a, a situation mm-hmm. and we were all laughing about it. And we weren't laughing because it was right. We were laughing because, oh my God, people did that. That's what we're laughing at. We're like, we can't believe people did that. And it make made, it make us, aware, made us aware of that's just ridiculous. Because you don't laugh at something that's not ridiculous. No, that's it. So humor is a brilliant a brilliant tool and it is the quickest way to to shift emotions from a really low vibration to a high vibration and you know maybe i'm lucky because i was raised that way by my parents mainly my dad you know my dad was not a cruel man but for the love of god he would stop joking <laughs> and in some days it seemed cruel you know because i wasn't up for it but it it taught me to like laugh at everything and he and the thing about my dad is if i made fun of him he would be the first to laugh so he didn't just 
Because I knew people that would make fun of other people and you say something back to them, they get pissed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they didn't live by the, their means of the way they were preaching. They didn't live that way. And I that's weird to me. Yeah, totally. That's weird to me. That's, I always found that then weird. Then it's defense mechanism. Yeah. Like, yeah. If you don't like humor, don't don't place it onto other people then. Like, don't make fun of other people, so to speak. But if you could be made fun of and you could be the first to laugh, okay, this, some, this person's living by the, uh, the their way they- credo. Yeah, the credo. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Thank you. So, and humor. So, humor is the greatest gift. I don't know. Humor is a great gift. Yeah, it's just, you, and no one can ever explain humor. Well, and it's underrated, you know. Again, though, it's weird. We act like certain things um, are, 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 it's not okay to laugh. We have to take certain things seriously. And the one thing I've realized about this life is the more serious we take it, the, the funnier the, it is. Yeah, the funnier <laughs> it is. And just the, the less you're getting from it. Uh, we are not meant to take this life as seriously as, you know, uh, we all do. Yeah. We, because what we're doing is we're taking this set of experiences and we're calling this set of experiences us in our identity. And we're saying, this is who I am based on A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all these different memories that have happened to me since I have a kid, you know, been a kid, you know, in this state, you know, in this family, in this dynamic, in this culture. And we call that us. And honestly, the, the, the point of this experience is to let go of all of that and realize that's not who I am. Those are experiences that I have, you know, had in the past. And I grow from them. I learn from them. I create from them. Um, it, it doesn't have to pigeonhole who you are or define you. And a lot of people are afraid to use humor because they think like uh, they're discounting something. Or you know they're it's a, they're poking fun in it um, as if that's a a big deal. Um, it's not a big deal. <laughs> we we should be we should not be taking life as seriously as we are. We need to take things more lightly because at the end of the day, how we take it is how we experience it. So yes, yeah, sure, go ahead, take it serious. You know all that, but you don't have to. You're choosing to do that. Well, I take my humor serious, so. There you go. I like that. And, it, you know, the thing about humor is um, it's not something you could head into a situation and say, I'm going to say a funny joke. To me, that's weird. Like when someone says knock, knock, I laugh. <laughs> they don't even have to get to the actual joke. I'm like, the fact that you're using knock, knock, yeah. you know, and I, I get a kick out of that. But um, Humor is definitely spontaneous. It is. When it's, yeah, when it's done right. When it's not done right, you laugh at the fact that someone said knock, knock, you know. It's like, oh, my God. Well, same thing. You can tell when somebody's trying, you know, to fit a joke in or something. Yeah. It just doesn't land. Yeah. And that's what, the, like, I, I've had experience with people come in and, like, a client, like, oh, yeah, my um, my husband died two weeks ago, you know. So I'm like, wow, you know. So you sit there and, you know, let them talk and console. And by the end of the session, we're laughing. Now, that was never my intention. Like, I'm going to make this person laugh because they just lost their husband. But it happens. And how did that happen? Right? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. And it's not that I'm uncomfortable with um, death. Uh, people that are, you know, suffering, you know, because they don't know what just happened. I get it. It's part of the mourning process. It's not that I'm uncomfortable with that at all. It's just somehow, somewhere along the line, something said and we start to laugh. And within a rather short period of time, and they often say, I haven't laughed since my husband died. And I'm like, well, that was you. It had nothing to do with me. It was an interaction that we had. But it's something that um, I find to be amazing. And it's not like it's a formula. It's, I don't know. It just happens. You know, it just, it just happens. But I don't want, like, yeah, it'd be like, let me tell you a joke because your husband died. <laughs> that would be, mm -hmm. that would not be cool. Like, you know. No. Yeah. It's creating a natural sense of space. Yeah. And it's almost like when you stop, when you let loose on defining who you are, what I've noticed is you step back and all of a sudden I step back and I witness myself being in these situations and more, you know, spontaneously responding to situations. When I do that, they tend to be more fluid and agreeable with the person I'm with rather than against it. 
But whenever I hold a thought strong mm-hmm. and someone comes in, I have to get this point across and I got to say it no matter what's happening in this conversation. It goes weird. You know, that's why whenever you ever see a situation where somebody's on the stage talking, answering questions, right? And somebody gets up and says, I have a great question to ask this person. I'm going to catch them. 99% of the time, unless the person on stage doesn't really know what they're talking about, 99% of the time when they're doing this back and forth, the person on stage always wins. Why? Because they didn't know, they were in a spontaneous place. The person asking a question had to write it down and come across it and want to nail them. And when it wasn't going their way, they they started losing themselves, but the person on stage is trained to not be sedentary in a thought. You have to be completely open if you're going to be open to questions. Yeah. So that's why. So when you look at it that way, it wasn't a natural conversation. But when there is a natural conversation, and it can be in a situation like that, it's brilliant. I'm not saying if somebody's on stage, you're out there. I'm not saying don't question. By all means, question them. But don't question them like you're right. Question like because I'm trying to understand what you're talking about. That's a different viewpoint. I'm going to question someone because I don't quite understand what they're talking about. Not I know better. I'm going to question them. Well, if you know better, why are you questioning them? Mm-hmm. Like you know, it, you know. So there's a different variance of that stage, different v- feel of it. So it's when we learn to discern that throughout life, life actually becomes very joy happy yeah you know i could be happy with a broken leg it's a st- it's happiness is a being a state of being not really a state of feeling you know it's who we are so maybe the word happiness and love have been skew- uh, uh, misused throughout time so let's use the word peace well we misuse all sorts of words you know and concepts all the time yeah we know? have yeah we have d- definitions from them and we all buy into them and now we're waving from it like right now all the <laughs> Everything's being thrown in the war, right? Is that funny? Yeah. Um, like everyone's trying to redefine everything. Oh yeah. But I, I find it funny. Like go do it. But you know, when I'm in a conversation and you, you like now I have to be like okay when someone says it, I'm like okay, what's your definition of that? Yeah. So we so I know where we're going with the conversation because you know if I use a certain word, people are like I don't like that word. I'm like, what don't you like about it? I'm like, oh okay. What, what word do you like? Okay, that word. Okay, so like God and say um, source. source, right? Yeah, thank you. Well, if someone didn't like the word God because of religious um, persecution that they may have experienced um, and because God was used the whole time in the religion and they got out and they, <clears throat> they, when they use the word source, it doesn't have a, a negative response to them. Okay, I understand that, but when I'm using the word God or source, I'm talking about the same thing. So for concession purposes i won't use the word god i'm like i'm not gonna force people <laughs> into redefining god the way i see it mm-hmm. so that's why we have these different words but um a lot of times people argue over these little things i'm like it seems like a waste of time to me well not only is it a waste of time it, it that's just more caught in the mind that's more part of the trap yeah yeah and it, there is a jolt of uh, energy to be right but it never feels good <clears throat> long lasting it's just it's just a jolt of energy and guess what? You know, you, you find out that even the thought that you held on to is shifting and changing. Well, and that jolt of energy that you're talking about or that drip, you know, of uh, whatever information going down your brain, that is that is a conditioned response and thought. And so we, we love to be right. Uh, yeah, see, I proved my point. I'm right. Yeah. As if that means something, as if there is really one right, but there never is. And we can take this with all sorts of you know different examples you know th- from life experiences it's very difficult to say that murder is always wrong okay well look at you well, know war a, history that's a tough sub- well, subject well no but you know what i mean yeah, yeah. i'm just saying like people say murder is wrong well great okay so why did your two cousins uh, you know went into the military and went to the iraq war what, why did they murder yeah. all those people they're going to well, say what are you talking about that was a murder well it's the fun, I'm just trying yeah. to throw out these ideas where yeah, so, it's very hard to say something is always yeah so like yeah obviously murder is something that and then they'll say oh could, that's not murder well that's well, different yeah well like, no it's murder <laughs> well, they, they it, killed those it, gentlemen. it's killing yeah. So the, 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 there is, you know, when you look at the, the, you know, the language, murder and killing are two different things. Yeah. So I, I killed someone because um, they came out in front of my car. I didn't murder yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. I didn't intend to uh, to do them harm. Um, 
Like even if I was fighting someone and I killed them, they call that manslaughter. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact that you fight, uh, you should have known that. There's a chance. There's a chance to happen. But, um, you know, so s- soldiers are going in to kill people. Um, in in those formats, it's not considered murder. Mm-hmm. Unless they do something out of line, then they, they won't be held by any, um, you know, court system. Yeah. So, so like, the, yeah, murder murder and killing. Like, someone actually told me, I don't know if it's true or not, but like in the, in the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shall not kill. Mm-hmm. They said that's translated wrong. It should be thou, thou shall not murder. Hmm. So, I just heard that. I'm like, oh, that's interesting because killing and murder have two different understandings in the English language you know when That's you murder true. someone it was intent and we don't do that but if you killed somebody you know driving in a car and someone ran in front of you you killed them yes I was part of that killing but it wasn't I'm not going to go to jail for that and so you know obviously an individual still suffered that took somebody else's life but it was an intent and that's how the difference between those languages so you know and I think that's what happens is we get caught up in these definitions so basically what like we try to do in the show here is not try to say take this perspective but when you keep shifting your perspective and loosening up the one thing that never changes is the witness to that perspective that is where home is that's where life comes and you'll know exactly what to do because people often say well in this situation what should I do I'm like well how do you want to feel in any situation well practice that feeling start with meditation and then go out and get in traffic. And I'm, okay, I'm starting to feel annoyed. Well, then, okay, do a breathing technique. I don't suggest you close your eyes. And then get back to that feeling even though you're in traffic. Because you'll say, well, I'm going to feel better when I, when I get off from work. I'm going to feel be- better on Saturday and Sunday. I'm like, that's a tough way to live your life. But when you start to practice, if you will, feeling good regardless, all of a sudden the world becomes easy. You're actually training yourself. You know, just like a soldier does, you know, or a firefighter, you know, they light a building on fire purposely mm-hmm. and then they put it out. But the next fire they're going to go to, that's real. It's not the same building. It's not the same amount of fire. But they have confidence enough to go in and know what to do when they're faced with it. But they've never been there before. But they've practiced. They, you know, they, and then they, now they're going from a response place rather than a reactive place. But when you find yourself reacting, try to put a little practice in there of like, okay, why am I reacting this way? Because I don't like the way it feels. Well, it's traffic. I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> unless you're working from home, you're always going to deal with traffic, you know? Um, so why? Can I bring that, can I bring my mind down, slow it down to where the traffic doesn't bother? And once you start to do that, it becomes amazing. But then it keeps going. It never ends. Right, just like I can't work out, and that's what this experience is. It just keeps going. It keeps going. Yeah, I can't just go to the gym for a year and expect it to last me for the next five years. The workout I did only lasts me for the workout I did. It, you know, it do, it doesn't have any. There will be there will be a future, or there will be a by um. There will be a byproduct from it, like a, a natural result from it but that's not why I do it anymore I do it for the moment where in the past I did and it always aggravated me mm-hmm. did I do it right I wasn't there long enough I should have left sooner I'm, I'm hurt and I kept the mind chatter all of a sudden it's like okay why am I even working out <laughs> I'm gonna do this <laughs> now it's like yeah it just it's a different mindset so the more you expand how you look at things the easier life will get for you yeah. You know, and know that just sit back and close your eyes. Do if you do a breathing exercise and know that your brain could calm down. We could do that with your eyes open. And then you realize that becomes my natural state. You might not have to meditate or breathe as much. You might not have to use that as a focus as much. And that's definitely the goal. Yeah. Is to be, you know, in that state. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So um Yeah, so that was uh pretty much a summary of Mine and Mike's last six months here in 2023. Yeah, just kind of how it feels. So, you know, again, if you guys have any comments about the, what we talked about today, um, you know, any questions, just, you know, email us at uh, Perspective Shift 2020 and we'll do our best to uh, answer you back yep. from the position we're in. But know this, everyone knows what they need to do. 
Um, and, it's inherent. Yeah, yeah. it's inherent. Just mm. yeah, do it. You know, and hey, we need. Yeah, it is nice to have. Um, Don't be afraid to trust yourself. Yeah, but also too, you know, surround yourself with people that are going to support you. Yeah. And even question you, like, don't don't be scared to be around people that question you because when people question me, it makes me think, I'm okay, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. You know, and and some other broader perspective comes out. I'm like, okay, this is brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode, right. guys. We'll see you guys next week. All right. Peace out.